Central South nearly 20 years ago and have been facing challenges for quite some time. The PeopleSoft application is complex and it requires a very specialized team for development and administration, which equates to costly. Uh, <laughs> we've struggled to get and keep skilled PeopleSoft staff and in 2017, the team dwindled from three developers and two administrators to one developer and one administrator. We had no backup support and we were on call 24-7. Um, it was difficult to take on uh, big new work with production to support. Our 2000 implementation was funded with capital dollars, uh, but no financial commitment or sustained support to refresh or maintain. While we managed to refresh over the years, we were once again facing the hurdle of end-of-life hardware and no money in the budget. To make matters worse, IT was requested to make the 10% budget cut. <coughs> <Not yet. laughs> Customer satisfaction had seen a decline as uh, performance degraded due to the older hardware and the users had reached a point of complacency and were just general complaining rather than trying for any improvements. So we came to a decision, revitalize and better support our ERP application. Use AWS Cloud to improve our hardware issues and have it managed by a provider experience with PeopleSoft to improve our support. Anything over 150,000 requires a formal RFP process, so we embarked. We received nine responses and did a thorough analysis of each. This included vetting their financial history and capacity, vendor qualifications and experience, hosting and managed services experience, migration and implementation plans, and making 27 reference check calls. In the end, we selected High Street for their experience level both with hosting and maintaining PeopleSoft. <coughs>
letter notes, what you're doing is you're finding stuff on like Monday and you're really concerned that you're going to have it done by your deadline, which is the following Monday because you're going you're to try and get that system live over the week. And you're finding stuff on Wednesday. You don't know if that's going to be ready in time. And you're, you're finally starting to not sleep and you're <coughs> putting in coffee and, and, uh, and donuts that were two days old in the office and you're just not leaving and you're not getting anything else done. Um, the, the thing that we noticed about this was coming into that final week, the biggest stressor was that we weren't finding any stressors. We, we were like concerned that they, they're missing something. They gotta be they gotta be missing something because we're not finding anything wrong. We're, all the tests are working. Everything's there. Uh, it was it was one of those moments where um, you're kind of concerned that as they start to go live, you're gonna roll this one back, and you, you're starting to work through that roll or that rollback plan. You're starting to wonder, all right. Do I have everything set to roll back? What's my rollback plan? The rollback plan for this is simple. You switch the DNS entry back. That was our entire backup. We didn't have to do something like restore. Um, and that's that was what made this so simple for us. In the end, yeah, they didn't actually miss anything. We had the ability to test our new production in parallel with the existing production environment. We had the ability to get that all set and ready to go. And yeah, in 24 hours. How much of the infrastructure did you move into AWS? Do you remember the exact server configuration? It's 24 boxes, I think. Yeah, 24 boxes, and were any of those boxes running VMs on them? Uh, they were yes. all VMs. Yes. Oh, okay, so in total VM count? 24, 24 VMs. 24 yeah. VMs. Yeah. yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and do you know how much data you moved? Yes, we did have a little bit of a problem with that, trying to figure out how to get that much up there, but we worked through that. Did they send out a truck? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to do any special transfers. No. We actually did transfer those a lot. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> how long ago did you do this? It was done in July. July. Yeah. In July? Well, we started it last summer. Yeah. So last summer. So it's been about a year. Mm -hmm. Have you done a, had an opportunity to do a cost-benefit analysis of what you're paying for AWS for the same these services versus the hardware, you know, what you were paying internally? Um, we, we actually ran the numbers on what it would have taken to upgrade and refresh the environment. So that was a $500,000 assignment. Um, what we're paying today includes managed services. So what we did was we took that, those vacant positions that Alicia mentioned and we turned that into our managed services, which includes the AWS stuff. So, we did it for no increased cost, so we haven't increased our OPEX. We decreased the amount that we're spending on salary. We just moved that over to paying for us. So annually, what would you say you're spending for the 24 machines mm -hmm. still currently? Yeah. Um, I would say that's coming out to about $150,000 a year. Okay. Half of, half of what we're paying for all MSP services. So. Cool. Thank you. Now, those are the, we're looking at this, and we're like, how much does this really cost? And I, I would highly recommend going the route of using an MSP or using those prepaid credits because you kind of want to have something in mind in that first year. <coughs> that was that was kind of our big question too, because when we started down this path, you know, we were thinking we're just going to do it ourselves. Uh, we're going to go in, go in, get our own VPC, lift and ship, and, and move everything from the from the on-prem to off. Uh, that's a lot of work, and if you've already got systems administration staff, that's a big lift for them to change mindsets from where they're at today to, to where they need to be in order to be able to do this. I think it's probably unfair to ask if they've already got a bunch of work today to, to try and learn an entire new version. <laughs> I don't want to do all your presentation. I have more questions, but I will. Okay. <laughs> is more than just hardware in the cloud with a managed services provider who is focused on providing personalized services and specializes in our ERP application. They know the quirks and the oddities that we've grown to love and hate. They have other clients they can reference and learn from. Uh, and we have the assurance now that PPS is no longer facing challenges alone. We have service level agreements and 24-7 support and not just a team, but a team of experts who span from the West Coast to the East Coast and to India. We have named SQL DBAs, PeopleSoft administrators, um, PeopleSoft functional and technical experts, and we can complete and make 
minutes in the hours that don't affect our users and we don't have to make outage announcements. With our cloud infrastructure, we removed the budget worries for the hardware upgrades and solved the problem of AWS variable cost. We have disaster recovery to another AWS zone, a better performance, we're kept up to date on our Oracle patches, SQL Server patches, and Windows updates. We monitor for outages, we have reliable backups, and we also get upgrades. Do you have any machines locally still? Servers locally? What services do you have running on there? Um, well, the, this was the only workload that we moved out our, sorry, oh, okay. this is the only workload that we moved out of our data center. So most of our data center is here. Oh, okay. Uh, we are, we do have a, a cloud first strategy. We'll get to that slide here in just a bit. Travis, yeah. one of the challenges I see is a lot of times people, how do you validate and compile your backups? Like, do you have, like, what assurance do you have with your provider and how does that cycle look so that you can sleep better at night knowing your backups are legit? Well, backups are, backups are always a, a fun part. What I will say is I had almost no confidence in my data center backups. Okay. Um, so I have a lot more <laughs> confidence in theirs. Um, one of the things about ERP environments, though, is that you're constantly <laughs> spinning up new instances in order to be able to test a feature or to read a bug or to be able to troubleshoot a customer issue. So you back up the database and you restore it somewhere else. Cool. That's that's the confidence that we have is we're constantly doing that. We don't need anything new. Cool. Mm -hmm. is that this is a this is a significant trust issue. I mean, you are handing over your ERP to a third party to manage. And you know, in our case that's our that's our HCM and that's our financials. That's that's the entire business for us. We we really needed to make sure that we had somebody available that could do this work and somebody that we trusted. So I would say if you're doing this, make sure it's somebody that specializes in your platform. Don't don't go lowest bidder on this. Make sure that this is somebody with after successfully migrating to the cloud, the collaborative team at High Street that worked with us during the migration is still the team that we work with every day. We continue to use the chat tool for communication. We meet twice weekly to talk about tickets, issues, questions, and plan for what's next. Performance has improved, complaints are down. <coughs> we're planning a major upgrade this fall for the application and we're trying to make the most of what we have. So not only was there no loss of life, we have extended and improved the life of my ERP. Okay. Okay. Um, and and just, to, just to add to this, um, PBS is planning a major ERP change in the next few years. And one of the things that we've managed to do in the course of doing this is kind of that, that cloud mindset for a lot of the internal staff. So um, previously we had people that of using cloud services now that we've kind of done this and not only shown that it works and it's stable, but there's actually performance improvement and cost savings from it. The, the option of doing something a little bit more modern like a, a Oracle Cloud or a Workday becomes a lot more viable for us. It's, it's something that we really don't have to work on that mindset when we go to look at what's next for talk briefly about some of the work I'm doing within AWS is looking at some technologies that we'll hopefully be able to introduce into PBS pretty soon here. So as a preface, um, you know, we're always trying to do more with less. Although we're a government agency, we're not immune to a lot of the effects of market influences, and there's an expectation that we keep striving. Uh, in Oregon, um, education budgets are tightening, and we need to innovate in order to deliver value back to our students and do it very quickly. Um, you know, and in addition to that, we only have two system administrators. So, you know, from my perspective as a developer, I need to figure out more, what I can do more on my side while alleviating some of the stresses on our system. And <clears throat> I do see uh, AWS as a solution. Uh, it is one contract with a whole swath of capabilities. 
we can spin up large prototypes like EdFi or uh, large analysis servers in a matter of minutes, try them out, see, see what, uh, how they'll work out for us, and then we can spin them down. Um, and so that's not buying up a bunch of new servers, so let's just bring it all up, try it out, shut it all down. Um, so uh, one of the first things I'm looking at is uh, how do I move data around in our organization um, and to enter our third party systems. Often, source, often uh, we source information from our student information system and we need to move it into, uh, into some third party system, oftentimes in that classic CSV format. And, and you know, we, we do use Clever, but a lot of apps uh, don't, aren't using Clever at, at this time, and some of those apps do use SOAP APIs or RESTful APIs. Um, currently, you know, uh, internally we do have uh, a service that we wrote to manage our ETLs that provide us the, um, the tracking of outages, that logs out all of our errors, is all the scheduling for us. But you know, it's all stuff that we had to write ourselves, whereas AWS provides a full infrastructure to do a lot of that work for us. So in, um, in this example, you know, we have our fetch data, which is essentially going to be um, data, data out of uh, our sys, and that's, that's going to be a lambda call. So that's a serverless call into AWS. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, you know, the whole cycle of the main physical server, um, we went to VMs, so you've abstracted your hardware, and then with the containerization, which is abstracted your operating systems, and serverless um, is abstracted basically your web servers and all those pieces. So it's just a little bit of code running in the cloud. So uh, you would make that call through an API gateway, which is going to be a RESTful endpoint, and then uh, in this example, you could have another Lambda call that would push a CSV to a third party. Um, or you can have it um, push it into a, another RESTful API, and the end goal is that that third party would actually be able to call into your API, and so uh, on demand. So at the time it may feel like they need to have more data, whether it needs to be more timely um, for like attendance, they can do that multiple times a day, or if it's just a nightly call, they can manage that on, on their own. You're just providing that endpoint. Um, another important piece I want to mention about this is that uh, AWS provides uh, a million free Lambda calls every month and a million free API calls every month. So if you look at the total cost of this for just running some of your basic ETLs, it's probably going to be free for the most part. Um, taking a step one step further, um, another search prototype of what I could do with um, AWS is working on serverless web applications. So instead of having a web server running in the background on a EC2 instance, um, you, you can track your costs directly to the web page render. Uh, so here you have a web client. Um, for all your static content, you would be hosted within your S3 bucket. Uh, we, uh, any calls would go through your API gateway, an API call that would go to some sort of database. Um, the, the basic one for AWS is going to be Dynamo. I do have a brief example of what this map looks like. I have one capability I've looked at of, of how I can make this easier for us. So for those who do not use Synergy, uh, those are student information systems. So here we have little, our student little lobby tables. And one dependency I have is the internet access we have here. So this is cool. <laughs> All right. So the other info, um, a challenge I was trying, trying to figure out with our new transportation implementation is how do we expose all the additional route information back to uh, our, our teachers and secretaries to know, you know uh, how, where our students are going and uh, you know, what kind of constraints they might run into and what buses they need to attend. So you think about bus tags, for example. So instead of adding all of your user-defined fields, um, we're going to opt to add a button within Synergy, just for our transportation routes, that links out to um, a service web app that puts our data in okay. It worked. 
So, um, this hits an API on the back end, I, and I reskin this uh, to based on a uh, Stoke API that Versa Trans is going to be providing to us. And you know, this R itself took maybe about three, four hours to put together. It does not take a long time to set up these circles web apps. It's all and it's all based on a CloudFormation template as well, so it's very easy to set up. And I'm going to run through a quick example. I'm going to try to do a live setup of, of a new service application. Let's see, let's see if I get this to work here. So uh, my background is mostly in C Sharp, um, but you know you can also uh, there's native integrations for Node and those kind of pieces as well. Um, for Visual Studio, we do new project. Uh, AWS provides a template for um, doing AWS service applications. So what this is doing in the back in the background, well, let me let's spin up first. This is just the setting up the code, setting up some of the configuration pieces. It's pulling some of my configuration from AWS from a configuration file that's stored on my machine. And we'll do one quick little change, make sure it's real. So if you right click on here, you go to publish. And I can barely read that. Publish to Lambda. Fix a bucket. We'll call it staff name. We'll call it um, ACP. And we'll publish. So all the orchestration setting up the S3 buckets. Uh, setting up the lambda call, setting up the IAM roles, is all being done at this point. In a, in a production like environment, you'd probably be running these activities in your uh, CI and CD environment, but uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery. And just a little bit, it will pop up the URL for this is being deployed. Again, this is running against the current wireless. Oh. Ran so much faster. Yeah, so you can see the IAM roles coming up here, staff permission, uh, and permissions, setting up the API gateway, setting up the functions.
question while you're getting that set up. How is Amazon um, to work with as far as whatever data confidentiality agreement you had to put in place to be able to throw student data and your financial data up on their servers? Yeah. Um, so we use we're using a reseller CDW, which has a lot of our contract language built in. So uh, our liability is based on CDW. But in terms of uh, our concerns about how, how secure our data is, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon provides a lot of core services to like, banks and a lot of large institutions that have uh, have even more stringent um, constraints to us, even like, hospitals and HIPAA and things like that. So um, I don't think we've had any issues with them signing um, any sort of contract and things like that. So when it comes to negotiating a contract with um, Amazon, you went through CDW? You went through CDW and a vendor partner. We went through CDW and a vendor partner. So okay. they, have, they have already pre-negotiated those on our behalf. And uh, our standard contract contains verbal language and the privacy language, and they've already signed. That, and that went through your RFP process, and that was embedded. And then Amazon did sign off on that. Amazon did. CDW, CDW did. did. So we, we have a couple of different VPCs. <clears throat> Actually, we have several. So one is our VPC that is managed by High Street that only contains our PeopleSoft environment. Another is our experimentation environment that we was just demonstrating. And then another is actually the huge part production. And those two are funded by the CWG money that they hold in escrow for us as usage credits, and we burn those down over the course of the week. So you pay CDW and CDW pays everything. Correct. So you're not paying It's actually a usage credit, yeah. and so long as you don't exceed what that dedicated instance would have cost, you're fine. You can build 20 instances or 20 EC2 instances, and you don't violate that so long as they're small. Just program. to recap that, because we've been having this conversation like, so Amazon or Azure, like, how do we get them to sign our NDA, you know, a Google, and mm -hmm. you're saying you guys didn't because you went to CDW and said, hey, they did. You, and they did. Right. Um, and they've already been. Allows you to uh, run a uh, run multiple multiple calls against the data uh, against an API. Um, so this is this is an example of the API behind the scenes following a typical structure, and uh, this is a, a schema that I pulled from from our first trans transformation application. So I'm pulling back all the data back from our API. This took me a hour to set up. Some of the discoveries um, that I have as I was you know, diving into AWS is that it's a managed environment and how it isn't. Um, you know, you can get into some configuration hell uh, just trying to figure out which what checkbox you missed while going down the uh, list. So um, it's good to have a partner along the way. Um, AWS has been great, CW has been great to, to work with in terms of being able to reach out and helping us out and solving some of these problems. Um, you still need system administrators. As much as um, I'd love to dig into setting up networks, it's not my core expertise. Um, and there, there are a lot of questions that I have and they can be able to answer right away. Um, logging and tracing can be, can be complicated with, with Lambda because oftentimes you would have, you know, funneling that information off to a flat file on the server or onto a container. You can't really do that with a Lambda call. Um, so you have to be, so you have to be pushing that into uh, Cloud front or whatever, or another 
or similar to a pool. Um, don't method shift your um, VMs, it's just going to cost you more. Um, really look at some of the technologies that are available to you. Uh, and there's lots and lots of technologies out there that you can be utilizing. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at is using Cognito uh, as, uh, for our authentication. So taking our ADFS instance and slapping a, uh, a login portal in front of any sort of APIs that we have. So Synergy supports ADFS. Um, you can use a, essentially use ADFS in the cloud. So same login, seamless experience for that page I was showing you earlier. Um, we looked at uh, using Glacier for some for backups, um, using our key management store, using a key management store for all those credentials that you have to have for all your vendors. Um, you know, so you're not storing that in plain text somewhere on your own servers. It's stored securely in the cloud, uh, and of course, you know, cloud formation. Um, yeah. So that thing you said moments ago about don't just lift and shift your VM is expensive. Yeah. So like, so we have 30 VMs, and out of those 30, 25 of them serve a single purpose for some application that's done internally for monitoring sprinklers or HVAC or something that we that does not have a SaaS offering. And we're like, is there a way? But it's designed to run in a Windows environment. Is there a technology through AWS that allows you to strip away the Windows part and just be like, hey, let's just put that in there? Um, you where I would probably first look is using Windows containers uh, for some of those pieces. Uh, because you can do, there's native um, Windows containers now, and I think in uh, 2017, was server 2017. 2016, yeah, they have containerization, yeah. Yeah, and that might be the first place to look. But you do want to look at just migrating those functions as opposed to the entire VM over. Yeah. <laughs> I have a follow up. Microsoft side, you did lift and shift, right? Yeah. Which is what has always been prohibitively expensive when you look at, especially um, you know, third party software that we need to run, which is, was written in a legacy way. Right? So the stuff that you're showing us here with Synergy is fantastic. That's, I mean, you, you do some of those Lambda calls. Now, are you actually running Synergy in AWS right now? Uh, Synergy is being hosted by uh, CTA for us. Gotcha. See, but 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 see, that's kind of where we're trying to figure out like where's the low hanging fruit because to do you know to do some third party legacy written system which is not written for any of the native tools that are available whether it's AWS or Azure or Google that's I think that's what's holding us back. Mm -hmm. It's not even so much the I mean yeah part of it's the budget because we look at it, it's like well okay yeah if we lift it and shift it there's no way it's just impossible. Right. But then we also are looking at okay, well, what, what sort of time would we need to invest in redeveloping those systems in, in a way that, that could function natively in, in a uh, hosted environment like that? So I, I'm just curious your perspectives on that because you're saying don't lift and shift, and yet that's what you want to do with people. So <laughs> we, we kind of did, right? So <laughs> our, uh, sorry. Uh, in, in our dev and test environments, we just ran a, a P to B and put it right on this menu. That was, that was Right out, copy, copy block by block what's on the disk and make it another disk out there that looks just like it. Um, what we did for our production environment was we did build new. Um, so we, it, the, <clears throat> I'm thinking we're, we're Nick is going to focus on don't lift and shift. Don't lift and shift your, your custom app. I mean, that's, you're not going to gain a lot from that. You might as well take advantage of these services that run just better than the technology that was available five years ago. When, when you do something like I'm lifting a piece of, of business infrastructure like that, yeah, it, it's not going to make much difference because we don't have a whole lot of say in how PeopleSoft is going to call its database or if I can use a SQL Server or a yeah, DynamoDB database. So what would be really cool is if I could get PeopleSoft to talk to DynamoDB. But it's Oracle, and we're probably going to say no. Yeah, they, they're, they're kind of picky about that. So. It, it, we don't have as much leeway in some of those environments. What, what we had was a, a moment of opportunity. We had a end of life system, and we could have either made this massive investment and basically committed ourselves to on-prem for another three to five years, or we could have taken that moment and said, all right, here's our chance to do something different and get some capability to grow the business and to grow the ERP along with the business as it moves <coughs> so that we don't have to go out and do another big R&D and another big purchase if we find ourselves running out of performance. 
Well, and like you said, you shifted your, your capex to your OPEX account, right. so which gives a lot more flexibility. It, it gives a lot more flexibility, and it's um, it, it seems to be a lot more easy to digest. And people people didn't see this giant check going out in order to make this change. What they saw was we're spending the same thing today as we did yesterday, and and the performance improved over the course of doing that. Are you familiar with Amazon Workspaces and Application Manager? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, so. Workspaces in terms of streaming desktop? Streaming desktop or even hosting third party applications. <laughs> um, so what yeah, we've we've looked at um, so AppStream is really the only way to go there. Workspaces charges thirty dollars per month per device, which if you think of what the PC costs, that's stupid. <laughs> I mean, there, there is no justification for that. Um, and Amazon knows it, and what they've really tried to force their education customers into is that app streaming. Uh, model instead, and you can do that for. Are you using that, by the way? We're, that's going to be one of our, our next projects. Is looking at doing that, looking at app streaming in our labs. Um, they are they are uh, doing a conference for education next month, and we're hoping to see some other things happen there as well. Cool. <coughs> cool. So here, briefly touch on DevOps. Um, you know, I want to take a moment to, uh, you know, what does it mean for, uh, it doesn't mean that developers take taking on all the work, it's a relationship between development and operations. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems that operations are trying to solve that we can you know, automate, where there's a lot of things that developers just don't know in terms of the configuration pieces that sound are going to way off the bat. Uh, as, as we enter into much more of a DevOps mentality, I think we're going to focus on four key metrics uh, for uh, performance indicators. You know, we talk about lead time, how long does it take us from uh, starting a piece of work to, to finishing it? You know, you think about like a script structure or agile, you look at two weeks, maybe three weeks. Uh, mean time to recovery, how long does it take us to um, to fix an error that's happened in production, whether that's, you know, if a VM starts to go haywire, you shut down, set up a new one. How long does it take you to get back to an operational point? Uh, how often are you deploying? Uh, right now, my team is going about 10 releases to production per uh, per sprint, so every two weeks, so five per week, roughly. And how often do your changes fail in production? You made a deployment, didn't do what you expected it to do, and you had to roll back. So the, uh, moving forward, these are going to be four metrics I'm going to be measuring my team against to see how well we're doing against um, other teams. Uh, but the last thing I want to touch on is like sharing is caring. We're all educational districts, so uh, you know I want to get to a point where we look at these micro front ends, like that first trans piece of how I can give that to other people. Um, you know, we talk about all these little functionalities that we could uh, be sharing in a, in a community, and what does it look like to just hand over um, a staff over to somebody else? So, you know, as we start looking at technologies like Edify and things like that, if you if you have something in that space on Edify, you can share with anybody else using using Edify. Implementation, and um, and you can use it right off the bat. And Travis, I want to talk about the future. So we kind of touched on on some of this already, but um, PPS is always going to be looking for ways to, to create new while keeping costs low. So you know our strategy is going to be SaaS first, cloud second, data center last. Um, and our, and I think Nikki touched on this, but our next exploration area is archival storage. So I think we've all got that that multi terabyte chunk of storage out there that people say you can't delete, and you know it's got a legal hold on it, and you have to preserve it forever because we never know when the court case. Do it all? Yeah, uh, sure, you can do that. But the nicer way to do it is Amazon Glacier storage. Um, so you can actually set up automatic policies where you store stuff in production, and then you can actually age it out. Lack of access will automatically age it out into Amazon Glacier. So Amazon Glacier is a pennies per terabyte per month tech storage. Um, fantastic uh, solution for stuff like that, especially stuff that you know you're almost never going to use. And something like a chunk of storage like that, you can hardly ever use it, but you have to store it somewhere. And storing it on the tape is probably a really great thing. So. Um, one of the other things we're going to start looking at is our document management.
banking system. So we have electronic student records or the key files. We've, we've printed those out over the course of however many tons of, of paper we've, we've managed to accumulate over the years. That's all been scanned into a document management system. That all lives on prem right now. And that's a pretty dangerous place to be. Um, we want to have that be more resilient. So we are going to put that in the cloud. Um, also, uh, we're going to be looking at streaming. So um, we want to make sure that we can better serve those live environments. We want to make sure that those live environments are consistent and that we do not have to have to deploy a human with a CD to go out and make sure that they're up and running. Um, <clears throat> another thing we're going to look at is our CTD programs. So uh, one of the things that really bothers me is that kids today are being taught that computing is the box that sits in front of you. And you know that that's just not how computing is done anymore. So, teaching kids from the start that computing is, does involve the cloud. Computing does involve more than what's sitting, sitting right there in, in front of you. Um, and then cloud formation. Um, if, if you want to get your nerd on, there is no better way than looking at what's available in cloud formation. It's, it, is it JSON? Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's basically JSON scripts to build all of the components of a computing environment in your VPC. So, Think of it as infrastructure as code. If I want to go and build an EdFi environment, I run the EdFi create script, and it populates 46 servers in there, and all the security groups, and all the networking rules, and all the all the internet gateways that you need in order to make that happen. And it finishes in about 10 minutes. Um, if you need to have a security event information manager, a big logging server sitting out there, you can run a CMonster cloud formation script, and it is done in five minutes infrastructure sitting there ready to roll. If you want to ever duplicate your infrastructure in another environment for whatever reason, you can copy that into cloud formation and completely rebuild your infrastructure. It's unbelievably cool and it has the ability to go out and do stuff that you wouldn't necessarily be able to just go out and do before. So when you start talking about the power of what AWS can do for you, it's in being able to run these experiments and you don't even know what you can do until you start looking at it and what, what possibilities Infrastructure in terms of uh, fiber uh, applications. And, uh, um, I think we have 10 gig out. Okay. <coughs> yes. What was your philosophy and thinking on choosing uh, AWS zones to have as your primary and failover? Like, how did you how did you go about that? Those choices. Um, we we work with our our. Uh, vendor to give us recommendations on what their other customers are doing. Um, are you talking about in terms of how far separated we wanted to have them? Yes. Um, I think we were doing great just to have more than one. And, <laughs> yeah, and the uh, the zones in the regions, right? So right. A, yeah, a zone can be a zone can be in the same parking lot as the other one. Mm -hmm. A region is all right. You got this time zone and that time zone. Right. Um, did we care too much about having it outside of the building that could burn down versus out of the parking lot that could be destroyed by an asteroid. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of needed to, we needed to set what our expectations were there. Um, a big chunk of that was access to the storage. So once you start talking outside of your region, you're going to have a lot of difficulty getting to the storage that you need to be synchronous. From a service outage standpoint, so like for the applications that you moved over, you know, Relying on offloading to this vendor uh, compared with internally, um, have you experienced anything? Um, you know, when we first went live, we had a little bit of trouble with one of the VMs, um, and like any troubleshooting effort, you get a little bit of, of this going on. Um, that wasn't an outage; it was more of a service degradation. So, so far, no. Have you? Have a redundant strategy or a failover strategy if, in the event, there was some you know, worldwide thing, Amazon took a hit or down or something. If something happened like eight months ago or you know something, um, do you have a strategy or plan for if that were to occur? No, but the the, the systems that we moved so far can probably handle eight hours of outage. So you know, our HR system is down for eight hours. What does that mean? We've got to come up with something. Anyone 
trust goes down, you know, sure. wide, I think there's going to be bigger problems going on than our systems. There's nothing else.